Hello and welcome to After Scientology, Straight Up and Vertical, the weekly show where Tony Ortega and I talk about last week's events in Scientology as reported on Tony's Substack. Hey, Tony, welcome back. Hey, Chris, thank you. Oh, what a fantastic last week with Danny Masterson's verdict. Of course, we did a special show about that, talking all about it. Uh, I'm, I don't know, my needle's still floating. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I know what you mean. I'm still stunned. Um... Uh, that moment is still kind of surreal to me, seeing him being handcuffed and led away. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'll tell you one thing that maybe uh, that happened since last week recorded. You know, I've been reporting on this story every day for six years. And this, you know, the thing with the reading the verdicts and him being handcuffed was very fast. It was just a few minutes mm. and it's over. Mm. And I was scrambling to report on that and I came and talked to you and I did some other interviews Thursday morning, Chris, mm -hmm. I could barely get out of bed. I was so drained and it was kind of like, uh, it was, and I talked to a few other people that had kind of a similar reaction. Like, what do we do now? Yeah. And it took a while during that day for some, um, some tips came in. I started, you know, I got a document for a very cool story Friday morning. But uh, I just, it was weird. It was a strange day for me. I didn't know what to think. And I'm still struggling with, you know, I've done some follow-ups and stuff, but uh, wow, what a crazy day that was. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and, so, and, 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 you know, and again, kind of from my perspective, there was just so much, it was such a pressure keg of anxiety and stress and like every day that was going on was like more and more oh it's gonna be awful it's gonna be awful and so when it became so good everybody was just yeah exhausted is the right word um now i had a couple questions or some as as we've been discussing this uh on my channel over the last few days others have had questions this next week, we have the evidentiary hearing regarding the discovery leak and what's going on with that, right? Yeah. And uh, I did get a hold of the order that because uh, Wednesday morning before the verdict and all this craziness, what was really interesting to me was that morning, Tom Mesro and Sharon mm -hmm. Applebaum actually showed up with attorneys. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned that in our last show that it was just really interesting to me, but they put it off a week. It's going to happen this next Wednesday. But uh, I was talking to some other reporters. We were kind of curious, like, how did they get Mesro here? You know, was he subpoenaed? Was he ordered? So I managed to get a hold of the court order, which did order Tom Mesro, Karen Apple, uh, Sharon Applebaum, Karen Goldstein, uh, and then the regular four attorneys to come to court. Uh, and that's why they were there. That's why they will be there next Wednesday. So... Very interesting. But, you know, what was also interesting was, um, well, two things. The order mentioned that it was a hearing about the discovery leak and possible imposition of monetary sanctions. Because mm -hmm. you had been asking about that. What are the consequences yeah. for these attorneys? That's right. So that's why Tom Mesro and Sharon Applebaum showed up with attorneys, mm -hmm. is they may be looking at some fines or something here. And then um, the other thing was that P Vicky Popresky was no was ordered to be notified, but she's not required to be there, which I'm a little disappointed by. I guess Judge Olmedo is focusing more on the people who leaked the material rather than the people who received it. Exactly. And yeah. So that, I guess that's why Vicky doesn't have to be there, which is a shame. But uh, yeah, that should be, I'm, I don't know what's going to happen Wednesday. I'm just really interested. That's why I'm staying in Los Angeles. Yeah, I'm I'm super interested in this. Um, and of course, it occurs to me right now that just because they are ordered to be there as part of this means, could only mean, you know, because I did jump a little bit on that, like, ah, now I think we know. But as more I think about this, in all fairness, it really could just be she wants all the players in the room of who could have done it. And now let's drill down and find out who done it, right? Well, I think we talked before, Chris, that Sean Hawley had hinted or strongly suggested that it was mm -hmm. the previous legal team, which is Mesro and Applebaum. Right. So, uh, I mean, it could be really entertaining Wednesday and we could see some finger pointing. Yeah. That would be fun. <laughs> but I have, a, I have a feeling they've all worked out 
Yeah. Who's going to fall on their sword Wednesday and to make it as li- you know li- less drama as possible? Right. But but that's I think Sean Holly had kind of indicated that it was the previous team, so I think it's Mesro and Applebaum that are going to be on the hot seat. Yeah, tra- probably true. And I don't know again, layperson here, but I don't know that uh, that Podberski is really going to be on the hot seat in terms of having received that information because I think it's the leaking part that they're going to have the big problem with more so than they can prosecute somebody for receiving it. It's not criminal property. It's discovery material, you know, so, and it wasn't under seal or labeled confidential by the court specifically on that line. So she might just kind of walk away from this thing. If I understand how this plays out. Well, I, like I said, I think they're going to focus on the attorneys who leaked it, and uh, apparently there may be some monetary sanctions. But to me, I think the most embarrassing thing for an attorney like Tom Mesro or Sharon Applebaum is simply to be certifiably labeled legally Scientology's shill. Exactly. I mean, who yes. wants to get that label at this point <laughs> in their career? Right. That's exactly right. And... And again, you know, again, not not expert here, but with Marcy's law on the line, there might be more than sanctions on the line for whoever actually did this because of the nature of what's going on. We'll see how it plays out. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Um, now, also, since we last spoke, there was this response from the Church of Scientology. Now, I want to I just want to put this out there because I don't know that I've ever said this exactly like this before. But, you know, I've been doing this for a lot of years now, I get to say that, and you've been doing it for (laughs) twice as long, and not only were you, your work, you know, crucial to my getting out of Scientology, it really was, Uh, some of your stuff was the very first stuff I remember seeing, blue asbestos on the free winds, I'll never forget that story, and, um, but your knowledge of Scientology, the ins and outs of it and whatnot, is really... I'm going to say for a non-ex member, par excellence. I don't know anybody else I could refer to who wasn't an ex member who's going to know as much about how Scientology approaches things, thinks about things, and operates. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I try. I try, and I'm always studying. I'm I'm not there yet. Well, it's 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 a process, right? Right. Now that all being said, this response comes down, and I did a live stream this last week and responded right. to the response. Uh, but I'd like to know what your response to it was. Um, thoughts on that document? Yeah, so uh, th- that afternoon, this response showed up at their uh, news press release sort of website. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's unsigned. And it's this rant that's actually, if you've been following the case, it's pretty similar to what we've heard before from them in court documents they're really unhappy that uh judge Olmedo has accepted this you know the, the idea that the ethics book contains this prohibition of, about going to civil authorities which of course includes the police and that the da has used this uh eliciting testimony from the witnesses so scientology is hopping mad yeah that the DA would would use it, that the judge would allow it, and that anybody would think that that's what the book says. Of course, all you have to do is read the book and use your eyes and you can see it. <laughs> exactly. But more than that, it's not just what's on the page. It's every single ex-Scientologist I have ever talked to and asked about this says, of course, yes, we are told we cannot go to the police if it's another Scientologist. It's drilled into our heads. That's right. So it's, it's not just, you know, how you interpret a line in a book. It's 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 very clear. So I when I saw it, Chris, especially that it was unsigned, I was like, this is just David Miscavige blowing his stack. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's weird because he knows it would be really bad for the Church of Scientology to say anything about Danny Masterson or what he was accused of or what he's going to prison for. And so all of that, there's none of that in there. Yep. None of those, there's not a word about Masterson or the allegations or anything. It's just the church has been harmed by this bigotry That's in these cases. So it was it was pretty ludicrous. What did you think about it? Well, of course, I thought it was, uh, you know, unhinged would be a word. 
uh, in terms of response, because of course the, the the response I saw people expecting, you know, when they saw it on social media was, you know, where's the apology? Where's the, wow, we've kind of reassessed our position. Where's the, oh my gosh, we are so saddened by this, you know, by this horrible uh, thing that happened that we, you know, we're inadvertently involved in and we, you know, and we're, and we're, you know, retooling. No, there's, of course, zero responsibility taken for any aspect of any of that. Right. Um, so, and, and the way I looked at it was I really thought it was a big pushback against, um, for the civil trial, where they are going to be a defendant. <laughs> you know, like, right. no, right. we've never, you know, and it's yeah. like we're going to adamantly put out there that we never stalked and harassed these victims. And how dare you say otherwise? And that's the last paragraph. The last paragraph says that there's not, none of this, it's all this allegations of harassment are nonsense. Exactly. That's the last paragraph that directly, you're right, directly uh, addresses the civil lawsuit. That's right. And what I forgot to say on my live stream when I was talking about this is that, of course, we have to remember the key audience for this. It's, you know, clearly has, has a, has a, it was released to the general public. But clearly, this is for the Scientologists yeah. to a great degree because it's kind of like, well, what am I supposed to think about this thing that's all over every major media? Yeah, you know, like how am I supposed to think about this? There's no way I'm not going to see it. There's no right. way I'm not going to hear about it at work. Uh, you know, my kids will probably hear about this at school. I mean, where you know, what are we supposed to think? Oh. They brought in Scientology, did they? Oh, those yeah, fucking yeah, assholes, yeah, right? Yeah. First Amendment, rah, rah, rah. So, you know, get the Scientologists on your I, side. I agree that um, that is an audience. However, and of course, we look at it and laugh because it's just so unhinged and it's just such a bald-faced lie. But th there is uh, some intelligence uh, to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and that what I mean by that is, okay, they've put out this crazy screed, but it includes a line that basically says, uh, it is not the church's policy to keep Scientologists from turning into other, other Scientologists. In fact, it's the opposite. And all Scientologists have to follow the law, you know? Right. And the, the reason why they do that is that news organizations feel obliged to then include that quote in their stories. Right. And the writer at the New York Times or CNN, because of the nature of how those organizations write news stories, can't include the quote and say, oh, and this is full of shit. Right. <laughs> right? right? So they have to just include the quote and they say, Scientology responded by denying that there's this rule, and here's the quote. They know there's a certain a percentage of people that will see that and go, oh, okay, so it's a disputed point. Right. They don't realize that it's not a disputed point, that this is Scientology just lying their asses off, and that every ex-Scientologist will tell you, no, it's completely true that we were told not to go to the police. Right. Um, and But they know that if they put out a press release like this, those news organizations will feel obliged to include it and they won't qualify it. Now, you and I, when we post it or talk about it, we always qualify it and say, look, people, Scientology is lying here. But the New York Times can't do that. It's just the name. And see, Scientology knows that. They're not as stupid as you think. They know how the media works. So that's why they put out something like this. So it looks ridiculous. But when people pull out the quotes individually, it looks a little less ridiculous when it's in a news story. That's my theory. Uh, and that's not a bad one at all, uh, because as we see, there are a whole lot of people out there who just don't know what we know. And so this is just another news story, just another organization, you know, and in some cases with an let's face it, with an awful lot of people in this country, the very idea of religion, you know, the very accusation of our religion was brought into this courtroom and put on trial is going to make some people's heads explode just hearing that. Oh. Well, the other thing I'm just thinking about now, Chris, is uh, the other kind of strange experience for me is, you know, during these last few weeks, it's been a fairly small press corps in the back row at the at the court. The L.A. Times guy is there. The ABC7 woman is there. The Daily Mail guy is there. We've all become good friends and, you know, chatted every day. 
And so we're the ones that get the very first stories out, the very first tweets, the very first indications that it's guilty and he's facing dirty to life. We, with the, those three or four of us get those stories out in the first minute, okay? But then as the day goes on, now you're seeing all these stories by reporters. I, I never seen any of those reporters. But, you know, they're just ripping and reading. They're rewriting. Yeah. They're putting together their own stories. And it grows to this huge group of stories. And it was interesting to me because some of these people were just obviously just putting stuff together. And some, it starts to not look recognizable. You know, I mean, some of the stories had some strength. Wong Kent, for example, said something bizarre about me and Leah that made no sense. I don't know where they pulled that out, but you know, it's, I don't know. Did you, did you, once the tsunami hit, did yeah. you have some reactions to what was being said? Well, I only was, I mean, to be honest, I was really only looking at headlines because I, I knew the whole story beginning. Right, today. right. I did not need to know what Rolling Stone's interpretation of it was or Variety or, or TMZ for that matter. Who oh, finally TMZ. picked up on it, right? Yeah. So I, you know, so I wasn't really diving into those details. I know that's more your world uh, for that. No, I was just interesting. I yeah. mean, it's it, it's funny once it becomes the world story and everybody yeah. has a, a version of it. And, and that's cool. I mean, and some of the, and I'll say some of them were very good. There were some really good stories. Mm. But like Daily Beast, which I've written for, had some funny... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> takes on it but you know whatever it, it's uh now and then since in the days since there's been some really interesting follow-ups from some of these publications because um you know while i was lying on my back thursday morning barely able to move there they've got a whole new set of folks come okay let's look at this angle and this angle and then so there's some really cool stuff coming out i it's very interesting it is it's you know that's what i appreciate is when people take a story and then, you know, kind of look at it from a different angle, not skew the facts, mind you, but actually look at it and go, well, what about this angle that, you know, we don't necessarily think about? And I, I like it when I see that rather than just the, as you mentioned, the rip and run kind of thing, you know. Um, now, let me ask you something just to clarify one other point before we move on, which was um, August 4th. Yeah. What is that? What okay, so there? she, Judge Olmedo asked uh cohen she said you're gonna want to file a motion what date do you want and he said august 4th okay uh i assume he's gonna file some sort of a motion to vacate the conviction because the whole trial was a joke or some stupid thing like that right. sort of a sort of a mini appeal sort of a mini you know immediate appeal kind of thing and she knows he's gonna do that so they just want to pick out a date yeah and uh, and that probably you know won't go anywhere. Right. That's not the sentencing. I don't think the sentencing's coming to like November or December, something like that. that. Okay, because that's good. when he's facing when he's facing thirty to life, nobody's in a hurry to right. get him back into the courtroom, right? So good point. Um, I will let me just say one thing though. You know, I know there's been a lot of uh, sort of prurient interest in the jail he's in and the hazards he's facing. I, I just don't want to contribute to that. It's mm. like, you know, uh, he's probably in some sort of a special section at the men's central jail, but can we calm down on the, you know, Danny being, you know, yeah, you know, victimized kind of thing. And yeah, I just, I'm not, it just, there's an, there's an angle to it. That's really kind of gross. And, uh, I, I want to focus more on on what put him there and and how that case unfolded. So yeah. uh, I, I'm less interested in in the facility he's in right now. But eventually he's going to be sentenced to state prison, and there's a lot of different levels of that. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, good. So that that answers the question in terms of when and how we might hear about sentencing because there's been confusion about that. Okay, now moving on, there was one other thing that you posted. In fact, uh, this was just on Saturday. You did a podcast with uh, Danny Masterson's ex-stepfather, yeah? Right, yeah, Joe Reich. I've, I've been talking to Joe for many years. He, I think he first went public on an Australian uh, you know, a magazine show, like a, like a sort of like a 60 Minutes of Australia. I don't know exactly which, ABC or something, Four Corners or something like that. And uh, I talked to him, I 
interviewed him for a story for the first time uh, 10 years ago. Um, and we've kept in touch. He's a very interesting figure. Mm. Uh, in 1982, he was near the end of his professional rugby career in Australia. He's Lebanese Australian. Uh -huh. And he, but he was at flag. He was OT seven. And this is before you know, OT eight. So yeah. at the time that was the highest level. And, um, he was probably the most highly ranked athlete in the world for Scientology. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very gung-ho about Scientology. He was at FLAG, and that's when he met this Masterson family, Peter and Carol, and their two young boys, Danny and Christopher. Danny was only about six at that point. Mm -hmm. And really liked them a lot, liked Peter a lot. And then soon after that, he retired from his rugby career, and Peter and Carol split up, and Joe started dating Carol. Right. And then they were married in 1985. So for 10 years, Joe Reich was Danny Masterson's stepfather. They also, he and Carol also had two kids of their own, uh, Jordan in 1986 and Alana in 1988. Okay. And that explains the little core group of the, of the family. So, so Danny and Chris were the children of Peter and Carol. Yeah. And then Jordan and Alana were the children of Joe and Carol. And mm -hmm. they're, so they're half siblings. Peter then also had a son, Will, in another marriage of his own. So that's, okay. Will is Danny and Chris's half brother, but he's not strictly related to Alana and Jordan. Right. But anyway, all, all of them were, they have been in the courtroom. Uh, I would say, Alana and Jordan may have been in more days even than Christopher, and Will has been in most days, not always. Interesting. Um, very, but see, I was told this before the trial, even the first trial even started, Chris, that this is a super tight family. That, yeah. Super, and they would yeah. be behind Danny no matter what. Right, right. So um, Joe and Carol then split up in 95, 10 years after they were married. He stayed in the kid's life. Well, of course, Alana and, jo and Jordan were his own biological children, but he, he, he remained in Danny and Christopher's life. So, for example, in 98, when Danny had booked that 70s show, had a lot of money and wanted a nice house, that's when he bought the Hollymont Drive house mm -hmm. when he was dating Jane Doe 3. And... Joe got him the mortgage because that was Joe's thing. He was a mortgage broker. So Joe Reich, even though he was no longer technically Danny's stepdad, he got Danny the mortgage on the Hollymont house, which wow. a few years later was the location for all three attacks on Jane Doe's one, two, and three. Jesus. Um, and so, you know, he just wanted me to know that he had remained in their lives. They relied on him. But then in 2005, he was uh, subjected to a committee of evidence and he was declared. And on the podcast, he described how he immediately tried to call Jordan, who was 19, and Alana, who was 17, so basically young adults, and couldn't get through to them. And he realized they had been told about his declare before he had. Wow. And so they were able to get the disconnection in before Joe could reach them. And he's never spoken to them since so i mean i've said this before to me it's kind of amazing that jordan masterson and also at that i asked i asked joe this specifically at that point in 2005 were they jordan reach and alana reach and he said yes they were they changed their names to masterson because he was declared right. and also because they wanted to be part of that acting family yeah. and they, they became actors of their own. And uh, Jordan got a recurring role in Last Man Standing and uh, uh, Alana had a recurring role on uh, The Walking Dead. Right. So um, I have said before that seeing Jordan and Alana there day after day is one of the most visible signs of Scientology in that courtroom. Yeah. That yeah. they have so, you know, visibly disconnected from their own father for all these years. They're never questioned about it, you know. So um, I, I the reason why I wanted to talk to Joe again this week 
was, you know, there's been a lot of speculation mm -hmm. about what's going to happen to Danny and the family now that, you know, Danny's been convicted because I've talked to former ethics people that have told me, look, once somebody's convicted of a crime, they're out. But again, you always have to wonder with celebrities because celebrities get to break all the rules. Mm -hmm. So I asked Joe, what do you think is going to happen to them? Are they going to be expelled? And he said, no. He said, mainly for public relations. They won't even expel Danny, and they definitely won't expel Carol, Christopher, Atlanta, or Jordan of because, in his words, they don't want to create five more Leah Remedies. Yeah, I like the way he put that. Um, and he's absolutely spot on right. I, I will say that I have never thought the church was going to get rid of the entire family. That was never on the table as far as I was concerned. But I thought, and I and I still think, and and I've really taken Joe's words into consideration because, of course, he lived that life. He didn't. He's not just talking about it. He was a Scientology celebrity and VIP himself. He was so, a Sea Org member, and, and that too. So I have to give you know, okay, he really does know of what he speaks, and yet, you know, this is a major crime and felony, and I'm like, my God. So my thinking still tends, I, I get what he's saying, and I'm not yeah. saying that it won't happen that way, but I still can't help but wonder if they really want to just do the read Slatkin on Danny and just, okay, just that's it. He's not, you know, disown him, but keep the family. And, I, and, and the main point that has me doubting whether the church can do that is how tight-knit this family is. Yeah. So, well, but, and also, but they also um, did disconnect from Joe. So could that? They, they did, though, earlier have this schism. I mean, Joe had right. to go. And the family stayed united with Scientology and was handled to disconnect. Right. Could re history repeat itself that way with Danny this time? You know? Well, what, one of the reasons I wanted to ask him about that was that I was thinking maybe Jordan and Atlanta will get kicked out along with their brother. And does that mean maybe there's a chance for a reunion? Because I just feel for Joe. I, I you know, he oh, talks, sure. he tells that story. And so I asked him that. I asked him, you know, if if they get kicked out, would you be interested in seeing him? And he got emotional on the on the oh, yeah. podcast. He was, you know, I think he would love nothing more than for them to be uh, have second thoughts about Scientology after this experience. And he said of the two. He thought Alana was a little more volatile and might have a moment of clarity mm. and realize, look what, you know, our loyalty to this organization has done for us. Um, mm -hmm. Because uh, let me just point out a legal point. Um, you know, if, you know, Jane Doe 1 went to the police in 2004, Scientology helped kill that uh, investigation. If Scientology had not done that and the DA had prosecuted Danny in 2004 for that 2003 incident, he might have been looking at, what, six years in prison, maybe eight. Mm -hmm. But Scientology killed that investigation, intimidated these women, did what they could to sweep this under the rug. And so, you know, 20 years later... Once these women finally learn about each other and the DA realizes, I think they probably realized they were hood hoodwinked in 2004. Now they take this case under this, you know, strict new law mm -hmm. and, you know, crimes that might have gotten him six or eight years in prison back in the early 2000s. He would have been out of prison a long time by now. Mm -hmm. Now have him facing 30 to life. So did Scientology really do him a favor by trying to bury these things? I don't right. Know. That's a, I mean, when you run the numbers like that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, after Joe told me that, I then took another look at that response. And you're absolutely right. If we think about that response by Miscavige being written for the membership, mm -hmm. it's not, well, we had a bad apple and we have to move on. It's this case was soaked in bigotry right. against the Church of Scientology. What's the subtext? Don't turn your back on Danny Masterson. He was a victim of bigotry. Yeah, exactly. Because here's, this is what I was just thinking about, was this is the exact point of decision for a lot of ex, where, where a lot of people become exes. 
is this point of what I've described as, and I will continue because I think it's accurate, is where a moral dilemma of irrefutable and undeniable magnitude hits the person in the face. Right. And here we have Danny versus church, right? And what's going to happen? And if the church turns on him, family, right? And the family, you know, talk about emotional needs, right? Family. So, so you're absolutely right that if, that if there was going to be a crisis moment that could, you know, splinter this family or, or uh, this situation with them in Scientology, this could be it. You know, which is why I was thinking that for Scientology and for the president's office at Celebrity Center, I imagine right now it's kind of a little all hands on deck regarding the Masterson family, right? Make sure these people are being, you know, cared for, catered to, getting in session, da, 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 and it's not truth rundown time for them and, and scrubbing pots, right? It's not that at all. I, you know, and Joe just sort of reinforces that point of view for me as far as that goes. Right. So anyway, great podcast. So I highly recommend. Uh, Thank you. I'm out. glad he talked to me about that. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's uh, I, I, he's always fun to talk to too. I mean, he, yeah. you know, that's he's a, a very very brash, fun guy. Yes, he is. He is very funny that way. I like him. I like him a lot. Yeah, he's fun to listen to. Uh, all right, and that was that was basically it as far as our okay. week in review. So. Um, so well, let, let me let me bring up one other little news story yeah. that I don't think uh, you and I talked about, but I wanted to see how much you enjoyed uh, David Miscavige's big success in Ireland. That he has now oh. grown the he has grown the membership in Ireland by fifty percent. Yeah, two X, baby. <laughs> That's even more than forty-seven times. No, fifty percent growth of Scientologists in Ireland. Which sounds like a lot, but it means they went from 87 members to 132 Woo. Uh, over yeah, six years. X. That's right, 1.5. So, yeah, really exciting. I am sure Ireland is straight up in vertical. <laughs> Um, yeah, you gotta laugh. I, I actually did a podcast with a guy completely not related to Scientology two weeks ago, who is an Irish blogger. And, and he's, you know, the, the Scientology is just nowhere out there. Just nobody talks about it. Nobody knows anything about it. It's Catholics and Protestants. And that's, that's well, and what, what makes it so great is that he has spent so much money there, Chris. Oh, like you wouldn't believe, and I must, I I just keep returning to how it must be a tax haven or it must have, must have some financial. The United interest. States is a tax haven for Scientology. They don't uh, need Ireland as a tax haven. Yeah, I know. I don't, I don't get it. I'm telling you, it's just it. to impress Tom. I, you know, yeah. Tom went over there, yeah. got an honorary uh, citizenship. Talked about how much he loved Ireland, oh. and so his best his best buddy Dave okay. decided that okay, we got to make that a, a Scientology country. You know, that's actually a shallow enough reason that I totally believe it. Actually, that, I think totally. that's it. I, I I cannot argue that at all. Um, okay, well, that's all right, a big news out of Ireland. So with that, uh, subscribe to Tony Substack. You've seen the address there on the screen. Uh, Tony, any last words? Just, uh, you know, getting some good new tips. I, you know, I told you the day after I felt deflated, but some new interesting stuff is coming in. And, uh, and I just want to say Leah Remini put out a fantastic statement mm. after the conviction and talked about how determined she is that this is just the beginning. Wow. So, uh, I don't know. I think things are going to get even more interesting from now on, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. I really think so, too. And I've basically said as much in my live stream. So if you all have not seen those from last week, do check them out. There's uh, there's Tony and me talking about the verdict. And then there is me breaking down this uh, response. And then my Friday show, I actually kind of projected some things far out into the future for Scientology. Um, all right. Yeah, you know, made a little comparisons with the Catholic Church and exposures there and you know what's happened so check that out and that all being said i'll see you guys next week bye bye